used to be I could just walk into class and start. <laughs> no, standing around before class drives me nuts. All right, let's do this thing. Uh, we get more vowels today. I've heard from a number of you what a great pleasure this is. Uh, more pleasure coming your way. Uh, but first, uh, administration. The midterm will be Tuesday of next week. That is this class next week in class. Um, I have a midterm study sheet that's most of the way prepared. If you can answer all the questions on the study sheet, you should be in really good shape for this exam, which will not have any of the exact questions on the study sheet, but will cover the exact same material. So uh, should be fine. Uh, when you come in, um, I am happy to, well, let me think. Do I want to let you bring in a cheat sheet? <laughs> I think that's a good idea, do you? I've actually really enjoyed seeing what people put on them. So I'll tell you what, you can have a half a page, one side only, handwritten, and you have to turn it in with your exam. But you're welcome to bring a half a page of any notes you want. Uh, you figure out how to make it fit. Has to be handwritten. Don't want, don't want printer stuff. Okay? Um, if you have accommodations that involve lower distraction testing or additional time, uh, drop me a note. We need to arrange how to do it. Come to my office hours on Friday. That could work too. Um, so that we can make sure we take care of everyone. Uh, any questions about the midterm? Okay, I did put together uh, one quick homework exercise for you this week. You'll see it on there. This should take minutes, but the purpose is to prepare you for something that will come up on the exam. And once again, it's asking you to look at spectrogram and waveform and just identify more or less where the transcription falls on that uh, spectrogram. It's not asking you to interpret a spectrogram and figure out what the transcription is. I'll actually tell you what the transcription is. You just gotta figure out where are the stops, where are the fricatives. And then it should highlight for you the problematic nature of dealing with uh, acoustic analysis of stretches of like vowels and sonorants, like I'm looking out, there's a couple stretches, like I have no idea where the boundaries are. And I would like for you to identify where you don't know where the boundaries are. So as you look at that homework, what's clear, what's not clear, and why? So it should be a fairly easy in the sense that it shouldn't take that long. Not easy in the sense that it's not that easy to do but it gets you started and it'll prepare you for one component of the exam where you will see a spectrogram and be asked to identify things in that spectrogram. Some of that will come in class on Thursday, some of it's already in the book, and of course DeAndre will save your ass in discussion by walking you through how to do it. The technique in particular, I, I advise you all, be prepared to use prop. If you haven't already, be prepared to start because that's the great clue. Once you get prop going, you can watch the bar go across as you're hearing things, and that'll tell you where things land. And you can, I think, slow prop down so that it plays at half speed, which is also very useful, because timing is hard when things get fast. And both of the things that I made up in this assignment are um, just me speaking English naturally. So it's not slowed down. Yeah. Is it due on Friday or Saturday? Saturday. Okay. Due on Saturday. I figured you might, you know, I don't know, have something else going on on Friday. Besides, it gives people a chance to come see me in office hours if you need it. No, I, was, uh, I was confused. Is it due Friday, April 30th? Oh. April 30th isn't Friday, Saturday. Yeah, yeah. Um, that would be <laughs> me fucking up again. Um, the trust, trust what Canvas says the due date is. It'll cut you off after that. Uh, and I'm pretty sure Canvas, don't, don't trust me, trust Canvas. <laughs> okay. Yeah?
I was just going to say, go ahead and um, it'd be good to go ahead and download uh, prop uh, before you get to a discussion on uh, uh, Thursday. That way we can just roll right into it and you guys can be doing what I'm doing and, um, you know, you can have that practice in. And again, notice it's mostly about the practical side of prop. I'm going to talk some today, assuming I don't get bogged down in vowels, which I could because vowels are fun. But I'm going to talk some today about the theoretical background that goes into a spectrogram, an acoustic analysis, so you'll know what it is you're seeing. Uh, and that's in preparation for Thursday's class. But for what I want you to do on the exam with identifying pieces of what's in spectrograms, you don't need any theory. You just need to know, practically speaking, when it's quiet, what is that? And the answer is, when the, when the line is doing all this and then suddenly it does that for a while, it's a stop. It is silence. When it's not wave-like, but just random squeaky noise, what is that? It's a fricative, etc. So that's, that's the kind of stuff I'm asking you to notice. I'm not going to say, identify the formant structure of these vowels and then tell me whether this is a rounded vowel or an unrounded vowel. I mean, that kind of stuff is, that's for Ling 411. Uh, there's no reason for you to have that degree of sophistication with acoustic analysis here. I just want you to recognize it's a tool. And you can use it as a tool, just like you can drive a car without being a mechanic. You can use the tool of, of acoustic analysis without being someone that knows everything that is in the, the sort of uh, physics of waveforms, etc., etc. So I'm just going to give you a quick introduction, and then we'll, we'll jump into how it's used for vowels on Thursday. I see a question now. It would be useful. If not, uh, you know, buddy up with someone who has one so that you can see in real time what's happening. And I'm assuming that you'll have a computer on a screen that might be uh, of use to you. I don't think there's a prop app, is there? Uh, app? I don't know. It's, if it's for the Mac, it's on, uh, you just go to prop on the, on the web and download it from, from the prop uh, uh, website. And I've got a link to it in the very first, I think it might even have been the technical stuff for the module before we started, just to say, everyone, go, go download this, because you will want it at some point. The point has arrived. Even if you didn't want it until now, you want it this week. <laughs> Other questions on administrative stuff? Is the midterm going to take the whole class period? I don't know. I never know. I mean, I look at this stuff and I think, oh, hell, that's not going to take them 15 minutes. And an hour and a half later, people are going, that was such a long midterm. So I, I don't know. Um, I think, yeah, we'll probably assume it'll take the whole period. I'll write it thinking, yeah, they'll be done in 50 minutes. And then maybe a few people will be done in an hour and a half. I don't know. I just, I've turned out to be very bad at estimating how long these things take. And because I have an absolutely shitty poker face, I never write an exam before I actually am ready. Like, if I'm going to see you before the exam, I'm not going to write it because you will know what's on it by just asking. And I'll go, oh, yeah, no, no, that's not right. Why would you ask? Um, so since I have office hours Monday, I won't actually write the exam until Monday night. Okay. And it'll be based on a bunch of stuff I've done before. I mean, I've, I've done phonetics exams, oh, half a dozen times over the last 30 years. So I've got questions I can steal from but I won't know which ones, and I won't know what new ones I'm making up until Monday night, Tuesday morning. So that makes it so that you can ask any questions you want, and I don't have to worry about uh, giving unfair advantage to people who know which questions to ask. And at the same time, uh, it does mean that it's a little bit less predictable how long it's going to take, because I'm a poor judge. Yes? Um. I'd bet about 10. Okay. And, you know, and each one will have subparts. So there'll probably be one that's just, here's 10 symbols. What is the articulatory description? Here's 10 articulatory descriptions. Give me the symbols. Uh, give me the IPA symbols. Here's some diacritics. What do they mean? Or something like that. Or here, the symbols might already have diacritics. I don't know yet. So it'll be that kind of stuff. Then there will be questions about what's the difference between a narrow and a broad transcription, for example, or what's um, uh, what are what are the articulatory correlates of 
place of articulation, point of articulation. What's the articulatory, articulatory correlate of manner? Uh, you know, so that kind of stuff. Right? What's your mouth doing when we're talking about different manners, etc.? So I'm going to try to tie it to anatomy. I'm going to try to tie it to acoustics. Try to tie it to the physiology, the movements you make when you're producing the sounds. I'm going to try to tie it to you know your recognition of the symbols. Oh, and we'll have a transcription exercise, of course. So I'll, I'll have the pleasure. Maybe I'll ask, since you've been working with DeAndre on that, it might be unfair to, have to transcribe something I say. But uh, we'll work something out for a transcription exercise. It will not be a significant part of the points, because after all, it's not a significant part of what you've been learning in this class. But you have been exposed to it, and I do think it's something you need to hear more of. And so this will be a chance to practice that idea. Oh, I hear it. Can I produce something that sounds similar? I can. What's my mouth doing? <laughs> and that's how you get at the articulatory description, and that's how you get at the symbols. So it's a chain of logic. You hear it, you do it, you figure out what you're doing, and you figure out what the symbol is for what you're doing. Okay? Other questions about the exam? Yeah, it'll be on a piece of paper. So do bring a pen or a pencil or whatever makes you comfortable. Anything else? Okay, good. On to the fun stuff. First, I had some fun uh, right after the last class. You know, the uvular fricative and the uvular trill. R and R or whatever it is. Um, yeah, so thank you, Layla. Uh, uh, there were two websites. Oh, come on, piece of shit. There we go. I just want you to hear this. You can click it on your own. So look at this. Here's the description. And there is the... Je. Ooh, so the first one. There it is. They're claiming it's a fricative right here, right? Listen closely. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Listen closely while I plug in the sound and make sure it's turned on. Volume up, okay, good. And my volume here should be up, shut up. Okay, it's all set. So, come on, baby. That's not what I wanted to hear. Rouge. Ah, again? Rouge. Hear that? Rouge. You hear the little Rouge. Listen again. Rouge. Rouge. That is not a fricative. That is an uvular trill. And, uh, let's see. Let me go back to my... Now, let's do this one. And let's see. 26 seconds in. Oh, you piece of shit. I get families at home. Bonjour. We are looking at how to pronounce the color of the famous cabaret in Paris. But how do you go about pronouncing it with the typical French pronunciation? It would be rouge. Hear that? Rouge. 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 Not even a hint of a trill. Two native speakers saying it differently. It makes me so happy. But in French, rouge. So, thank you for making me happy. Thank you for letting me share this with the class. If you find more cool shit like that, feel free to send it to me. This is like, you know, hey, phonetics is practical. You can understand why, uh, you know, different French instructors will tell you you're saying rouge wrong or you're saying rouge wrong because you're saying it the other way, but it's just fine. Uh, not that you should tell that to your French instructor, at least until after the final grade is in. Then you can go <laughs> tell them they're full of shit or whatever floats your boat. So this is a list of diacritics you need to know. I consolidated it from the last two lectures. Not going to go through them now. Just want you to be aware they're all in one place. Uh, you'll be able to download these slides or the PDF based on it, just so you can see them. When you see these, I expect you to be able to give a full articulatory description of everything between phonetic brackets here. Then moving on to vowels. This is what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about nasalized, rhoticized, long, breathy voice, creaky voice. Actually, I'm not going to talk anymore about breathy voice and creaky voice, except to say that they exist. And 
uh, a little bit on tone, just just to say it's it's not really phonetics tone. So we also will avoid that issue a little bit. Um, so a reminder. Oh, hello. I have to remember to go to my alt monthly meeting. Jesus. Come on now. backwards. Oh, I can't even do it. Oh, I can't handle having this thing come along and show the meetings that I'm going to be supposed to be going to that I already told them I can't go because I'm teaching, goddammit. But they sent me the things. So, there. Now it won't come up anymore. So, looking at articulatory features for vowels. You remember the vowel quadrilateral? And that's about getting the where is the tongue with regard to front, central, and back? Where is the tongue with regard to high, mid, low? Um, the advanced tongue root, I'll talk about briefly. It's in the chapter, and it's something that you'll want to go to their website to look at. And I'll, I have left a link into the slide when we get to that part. Um, lips, remember the spread versus round. The velum, or the soft palate, oral versus nasal. In the larynx, you can do all kinds of tricks. You can have creaky voice. You can have breathy voice. You can have uh, tones. You can have vowel length. Uh, and that's just all in how long you keep your larynx turned on. So those are all different laryngeal features that alter vowels. Those are all things that we will briefly talk about today. Here's a reminder of the English vowels. So we got the beat, bit, Bait, bet, bat, butt, bite, boot, put, boat, bought, pot, bout, and cute. There is no, I guess you could say butte, huh? Butte could be like bit. Hey, that's a real butte. Okay, so never mind. I made a mistake putting cute up there. So that's just your reminder of English vowels. Reminder that you have, as a speaker of English, the ability to hear you know, a good dozen, or is that 14 different vowels? Three of which are, well, five of which are diphthongs. But still, a lot more vowels than many languages have. So that's already a good starting point. We filled in some more central vowels. So there was the uh, that just not, it's not really the uh, it's the uh. <laughs> that is sofa, not but. But and sofa. The uh in sofa is a different vowel from the uh in but. It's the unstressed, reduced. Your tongue actually doesn't take a real position there. It's just giving up, uh, going to a central location. You have the uh as in bird. If you hear a Brit say bird, uh, that's going to be that vowel. The a uh of pack your car is a central vowel. And then the high central unrounded that's in the way I say, butted, butted, ud, butted. So he, you know, the, the goat butted uh, another goat. Uh, that ud sound is the u. Uh, although again, what's the word I want? The unstressed version, the reduced version of a high central vowel. Now you can hear a really unreduced version in Caribbean languages. So the word putu, putu, that would be woman. Uh, the actually first person possessed form. My wife, I guess, would be a, a better translation. So, putu would be, that's the u of the high central vowel that you know, is a distinctive vowel in uh, a particular language. So now we're caught up with where we were with English vowels, right? Everything you saw was reviewed so far. So now we're jumping to uh, one more thing that's not quite review, but that's, that's um, well, I guess it's review still. So we have the separation of the vowel chart into the unrounded and the rounded. And you see that all of the rounded ones are back vowels. And all of the unrounded ones are kind of spread around more, but all of the front vowels are unrounded. 
Now, there is an acoustic reason for this, which they talk about some in the chapter. Um, I think it's worth knowing, and that's that rounding lengthens the upper tube. If you think of, if you think of a, uh, the oral tract as sort of a pair of tubes, uh oh, can I do this? And... Uh... Wow. Uh, proportions are hard on the fly. Okay, so there's somebody very happy. Um, this you could think of as, well, a horizontal tube. And this as a vertical tube. Those two tubes create acoustic spaces, which is why acoustic analysis of vowels works so well. As you're moving your tongue around into the different vowel shapes, you make the horizontal tube narrower. As you bring your tongue forward, you make it shorter. You make the vertical tube, when your tongue comes forward, the vertical tube is wider. And as it's a high vowel, the vertical tube gets longer. So you can kind of see if this is the fulcrum point between the two tubes, you can mess with it by moving this tongue around. So the tongue position, when it's in the back, as your tongue goes back, it lengthens the horizontal tube and it narrows the vertical tube. As you round your lips, as you round your lips, you lengthen the horizontal tube by about that much. That has the same effect as moving your tongue back. It lengthens the horizontal tube. And so what happens is lip rounding and the back of your tongue articulating a back vowel reinforce each other. They reinforce that that horizontal tube gets longer and that creates certain effects in the formant structure in the acoustic analysis. And if you don't know what formant structure is, don't sweat it, because that's what's coming Thursday. And we'll introduce formants today. The point I'm making is, it's natural that lip rounding would be associated with back vowels, because they do the same thing acoustically. They actually emphasize it acoustically. A rounded lips will make a back vowel sound more back. Unrounded lips will make a back vowel sound kind of central or indeterminate. Uh, Unrounded lips will make a front vowel sound more front. But you can round lips on a front vowel, and that alters the acoustics. It makes it sound weird, like it's halfway back or halfway something. It's like your tongue moved back, but your tongue didn't move. Your lips just made the tube longer. And so this is the default. As you go cross-linguistically in the languages of the world, back vowels, especially high back vowels, are rounded. They just, language after language has them. A few languages don't, but almost all of them do. And your front vowels, by and large, are unrounded. They have spread lips. And that, again, just common as dirt. That's the way it's done. And then there are these enterprising language ancestors who went about saying, oh, but we could do this differently. And they add lip rounding to front vowels. And they take away lip rounding from back vowels. And you can get more interesting charts that fill all this stuff in. So first, let's look at the high back unrounded and the mid back unrounded, uh, and just think about making those. So start with a high back vowel, ooh. 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 Try to hold your tongue as steady as you can, and just purse the, So you catch what's going on there, right? So once you get used to that back and forth, ooh, ooh, 
Just get used to producing that vowel after any consonant. Concentrate on spreading those lips. And you can get that sound. And that is your high back unrounded. Yes. Can you give us a, 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 an auditory difference between the barred I and the unrounded back? Um, maybe. <laughs> so, and it's actually, you're, you're pulling your tongue a ways further back for this one. This is sort of that, like, you know, hunted. Hunt, but this is, sound and clear as mud, right? Ah, well, um, practice will make a difference. I won't say perfect because I've been practicing for decades and uh, the folks I work with still sometimes laugh at my pronunciation of things I'm trying to repeat. Uh, one of the good things if you're gonna do field work is you can really get over being full of yourself and, and the need to be right will diminish quickly. And if it doesn't, you'll be out of field work pretty quickly because uh, you won't be right, especially at the beginning. So this difference, I am not aware of a language that makes that distinction for uh, uh, minimal pairs. So like there's not, I've, I've never run across the language where the difference between putu and putu uh, and, well, those are the two. Putu and putu are two different words. Uh, it seems like what really happens is there's a contrast between e and u and a contrast between u and u, and then people argue, was that a, a back vowel or a central vowel? And then there's all this argument, and there's no way to settle it unless you bring someone in to do video x-rays, which we don't, uh, because why does it matter? Um, don't, I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> strike that from the recording, please. Um, but uh, I guess the, the point I want to make here is, well, Actually, I can say this, I did. I just wrote a paper on this vowel in a number of Caribbean languages. It has been transcribed as that vowel and that vowel and that vowel. And as far as I could tell, having worked with 15 different languages, it's that vowel. But I have no idea how to prove that to a skeptic, right? So you've got, uh, uh, let's see, the word uh, meaning on. It's the kind of on, this is on the blackboard. You know, puka, and these are on the ceiling. So, what is it? On a vertical surface or on the underside of a horizontal surface. So that kind of attached to on. So, puka. So I think I say it more like this, puka, but puka, you can raise it just a little bit, puka, puka, as opposed to ooh, ooh, not, not, ooh, uh, uh, and that's the uh from English, like but, oh, uh, and then butted. Or it, anyway, this uh is a little higher and it corresponds in height to the A in the front vowel. Uh, and it's unrounded. Everyone is sure it's a central vowel. I just explained why they would be. Why would everyone think that's a central vowel? Because it's not rounded. Because it's not rounded. You keep your tongue in the exact same back position to say oh. And then you just go, oh, oh, oh. And it's like, it sounds like you centralized it. And it's just because you're losing the acoustic properties of the longer horizontal tube. It's not that your tongue came forward to shorten the tube, it's that your lips came back to shorten the tube. So it sounds central. How do you get at it? I have no idea. Am I going to grade you harshly if you can't identify this? Hell yes, because all my colleagues can't. And someone's got to start getting it right. Um, so look for it on the exam. <laughs> These two, I'm putting in there so you'll know they're there. I think everyone should know how to say U. Uh, it also shows up, I mean, doesn't Japanese have U instead of U? Yeah, I mean, it's written as U in the orthography, but it's actually the unrounded U. Yeah, and there are a number of other languages that have, Russian has it in there somewhere. I don't know any words that have it, but I've heard people say, oh, I know that from, and it's like, yeah. You should know these from languages, right? If you study languages, 
This is what languages do that aren't English. So it's kind of cool that there are these sounds in languages other than the ones I study in the Amazon, right? But now we get to the fun chart. Look at all the red here. Of the red here, I would particularly like you to be able to hear these three. Those are the three that matter. The front high. The two front high ones and the one front mid one. So if you compare charts, there's E. So you say E. Okay. huh? So I thought, thought I heard someone start to say something, and I was looking to see whose mouth was moving, and everyone else had a mask on, so I was like, aha! What is it? Oh, but no. Anyway, the point is, E is the high one. It's like an E, but with your lips around it. They have that vowel in French, and it took me a long time to differentiate between cul and cul. Right. One means a sweater, and the other one means a chicken. <laughs> and you came all the way down to this one, I think, for the chicken. Uh, that's also what? Fire or food? Or food? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember which one is fire. I don't speak French well. In fact, I barely speak it at all. Yeah, fire. Uh, Fu is fire, then fal, crazy. Okay. Like feminine. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> so, point being, I'm just asking you to learn the mechanics. You don't have to pronounce German or French correctly in order to do this. All you have to do is be able to say E, hold your tongue there, E, E. So the E is what your tongue is doing and the U is what your lips are doing. E, E. So come on, this is too quiet. E, E. Yeah? See that work? All right, now do the other one. I. You got I already. E, E, E. And then you've got A. Now, not the A of English with the diphthong. Just get the first half. The A, 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 A. And then you could do the same with the others. You could go A to E. And you could go Pak ya ka, Pak ya ka. You can do all this stuff, and the U can become U. Uh, they're all there. Frankly, I can't hear them reliably. So I'm not in a good position to examine you on your ability to hear them reliably. What I am in a good position to do is to get you to track where in your mouth you're making them and make that connection, the tongue-ear uh, connection, coordination, so that when you have your tongue and your lips in the right position, you know what that sound is, and then you can go listen to it on the various IPA websites or on the website associated with our textbook. They run through those. You can hear all those vowels said by fluent speakers of languages that use them, unlike, say, me, who just happens to be a guy that uses vowels for fun in phonetics class. I'm just going to add for that U, uh, right? So, again, like you mentioned, obviously, French, um, uh, you also get it in German, uh, and, of course, Mandarin, that's the U as well. And notice... What's key here is they had to make a choice how to write it because, you know, umlaut is generally written, you know, that's just the u brought to the front, right? So if you see the little, the little two dots above a vowel, usually what it means in the writing system is it's something that's started off back that's moved to the front. And so if you have u and u, you have o and u, you have a, Let's see, I think that would be like this, and er, and e, or a, a, thank you. So it's the one, we'll see it, and again, it's different in Scandinavian, which uses this. You can see they borrowed Scandinavian for the u, uh, uh, to, for the way of writing it here. So anyway, they're just, there's a lot of variation in writing systems. It is die Brücke, right? Die Brücke. 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 There we go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, is it, I was just trying to check if it's feminine or I was like, I can't remember if this is actually feminine or not, but it is feminine, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> so think about using these vowels in your mouth to get used to the idea of what you're doing. But key is that you remember where they go on the chart. 
And this is the chart we had on the first day of class. I broke it apart for you. I just put it back together. All right? This is uh, the idea of the, is it, as they say, close, close mid, open mid, or open. Is it front, central, or back? This is the chart that was adopted by uh, Latifoget and Johnson. Now, I'm about to show you other charts, as a couple of people have pointed out. No, but I've looked online. The real way these are organized is, and, and give others, uh, sorry, there is no real here. There are ways that various experts choose because they think this is the best way to do it. And they each have their followers. Um, this is not the one I follow. So I'll say, this is here. If you give, so for instance, quickly, give me an articulatory description of that vowel on the basis of this chart. Open mid. Open mid. Open mid. Front. Front. Rounded. Rounded. You're done. That's all you need. All right. And now let's go with that one. Okay. If you do that, you will pass. If you are capable of doing that, you know how to get from the symbol to the articulatory description and how to get from the articulatory description to the symbol. What about the ones that are kind of floating, like in between the lines or in between? I'm places? glad you asked that. Um, <laughs> I, I have my own issues with those. I'm going to come back to that in about three slides. Okay. Um, so this is why they chose the one they did. A guy named Daniel Jones, 140 years ago, came up with sort of the, this new way of thinking about vowels because they didn't have like x-rays that they could do tracings of the tongue with. And they didn't have ways of climbing into people's mouths with cameras and looking to say, ooh, what are they doing? And so they said, and they didn't have acoustic analysis either. So they said, here's what we'll do. We're going to create a system that people can be trained in. And so we will teach them to say the most extreme vowels. E, like as far forward as you can push your tongue and still have a vowel. E, A, and then everyone is trained with Daniel Jones himself until he died. And then with one of his disciples until they died. And then with one of their disciples until they died. And now we're in the point where even like 60 year careers, by the time you stack up three of them, there are probably still some academic grandchildren of Daniel Jones that are still teaching this. Because the only way to learn it was to learn it from Daniel Jones or one of the people who studied with him. Because you had to be trained. It was like learning another language. And this was for a hundred years, the only way that people described vowels. So they said, get the most extreme front, the most extreme back, the most extreme high, the most extreme low. Those are your eight cardinal vowels, your primary cardinal vowels. Then you can get in and mess with it. You can do rounding, you can do unrounding, you can put, uh, you can put a schwa in the middle, you can get these. Those are your secondary cardinal vowels. Mostly, notice they're peripheral because that's something you can kind of do articulatorily. You can say, what's the farthest forward I can make my tongue go at the low position, at the high position, etc. So you can actually get at something. And then you train to learn to hear other people's cardinal vowels. Then comes the fun part of the training, which is um, learning how to indicate yeah, that one is this vowel except in a little and up a little. That vowel is this vowel except in a little and down a little. And then you have these little diacritics that you add to vowels to indicate how far it has moved from the cardinal vowel position. And if that doesn't sound like fun, I don't know why you bother to study linguistics. Um, I actually, uh, you can go have a look at these cardinal vowels if you like. Uh, I am only telling you about them because they're a historical artifact. This is the way that linguistics was done before technology. It's kind of cool. It was innovative and it was the basis of descriptions for a hundred years. Uh, it is no longer the basis of descriptions. Unfortunately, 
there is still a hangover. How many vowel heights are there? What a coincidence. It's exactly the vowel heights of the cardinal vowel system. What do you know? Latifoged was an academic grandchild of Daniel Jones. And he's the guy that wrote this book originally back in the 80s. Uh, I used a, a much earlier version of this book when I was a linguistic student studying phonetics for the first time in winter of 1987. And, and Latifoged already, this was what he used. And Johnson did not see fit to change it because Daniel Jones, you know, there is no bigger name in phonetics. So as you look at this, as you look at this, this raises, these are your, your four heights. So close is what I would call a high vowel. Open, you know, close, open. Uh, you, know, you drop your jaw, your mouth is open. That's a low vowel because when your jaw is way open, the top of your tongue is way low. In fact, singers, I've, you, some of you have been in choirs, right, where they're trying to get you to get the largest resonating chamber possible but still articulate the vowel. You know, has anyone ever had the pleasure of singing, ooh, and then they're like, no, no, open your mouth, though. No. ooh. <laughs> so you're trying to drop your jaw and have your tongue high at the same time. You end up cheating by just doing it all with lip rounding. Yeah. Um, open and low go together. Open and high, only singers, and it doesn't always work. Um, so this is their situation, and then the problems. Yeah. So... Pick a height, any height, for i and u and u. You know, what are you going to call those? We don't have, notice I didn't teach you the cardinal vowel diacritics, right? So I'm not going to ask you to say, well, this is basically just an e that's in and down. And this is just an u that's in and down. Actually, that u, it's actually way out here, except with lip rounding. Uh, we're not playing that game. So, in other words, if you don't play that game, you have no way to describe those three. And similarly, if you don't play that game, you don't have a good way to describe this one, unless you say, that's the center one, which is what the cardinal vowel system said. It didn't need to be placed because it was the neutral tongue position vowel. It was just everything centered, so mid-center. But there's no mid, there's only close mid and open mid. So there's no place for this as it were. And then, of course, you have the problem down here of these two, the at and the whatever the hell that is. Um, I'm not even going to try. <laughs> so, we got to figure out what to do with this. And additionally, there's the question of how far do you go front and back? You know? Now, this basically says, yeah, we got, we got three positions, right? Everyone in all the charts say there's front versus back. Some agree that there's central and some don't believe in central. And either way, these three are a problem because they are clearly retracted relative to this front line. This is clearly inward relative to the back line. We don't have a special label for that. So I don't know what to call it. It's the sort of front. The sort of high, sort of front vowel, <laughs> and the sort of high, sort of back vowel. You know, I guess as soon as you say sort of, you know which line it is. And sort of is a good technical term. Uh, actually, it's a sucky technical term, but we've got this issue. And it's worth wondering how these fit in. Uh, are they really right on the line? This one is out front. I don't know. What do we do with it? Um, so people have recognized that this is not optimal. And there are other proposals out there. So here's a nice, clean system. Doesn't that just look like it was made by a mathematician? I mean, there you go. You got six in the front, six in the back. So they're not all full. But, you know, every chart, every position in the chart doesn't have to have an occupant, right? So you got, it's nice. You know, e -I. Well, that's the high close and the high open. And then you've got a -E. And that's the mid-close and the mid-open. And then you've got the ah, ah, and that's the low-close and the low-open. And now you can mix your high and close and your low and open, and they each have different meanings. You know? So that's a beautiful way to go about it. And you could fill in more in that chart, I'm guessing, if you worked hard at it. And I like the idea of using different colors for rounded and unrounded. 
Um, although they still are doing the same thing with position, right? They have the unrounded to the left and the rounded to the right of the pairs. Uh, another way of looking at it, um, you still got the front back and the high low, and then it's sort of divided into three this way, but only two this way. And what do you do when you've got four symbols that fall in the same square? And that is the way that some people approach doing this. They say, look, it's messy, just admit it. And say, these are all different vowels that are in this, what's not a quadrant, sextant. They're in this chunk of the chart. And then you just have to give other acoustic properties to explain what they are. Or you need diacritics to say, this is a little higher, that's a little lower. And, you know, maybe you'll even be able to hear the difference between them. And this is the chart that I was using, uh, and actually still do use for the most part, except I put this one over here. Um, so you can see that if you go with just the three-way chart, for the top two, you could go ahead and say, you know, this is a close high, open high, a close mid, open mid. You could apply that same terminology to here, and you could get away with it. So... I guess what I'm trying to tell you is this is not a question of right and wrong. This is a question of how are we going to organize a world that's out there that we perceive, but our perceptions are not entirely reliable unless you train with Daniel Jones and, you know, pass his exam. Then your perceptions are reliable, but what do you do if you want to know how people who are speaking real languages do it? And, you know, in fact, how reasonable is it to ask people to learn that kind of a system? I am happy mixing this one and this one because I think this gets closer to the reality. The high positions seem like they could be subdivided. There are clearly four levels of height in the high and the mid together. The bottom one, I'm not sure that it really is subdivided. I think this was somebody saying, you know what? If we move off from here to here, it's symmetrical. We have two at each level, and that's, that's beautiful. Patterns, patterns make you happy if you're an academic. So I think someone was trying to make themselves happy here rather than reflecting what the tongue is doing. And deep down, does it matter? I'm not sure that it does, except that we need labor. We need ways to say, which vowel was that? Oh, that was the high, close, front, unrounded vowel. And you can know what that means without having to look at a chart once you memorize the chart. But you've got to pick a chart to memorize. So that goes back to the idea of, you know, there's always a danger when you teach about things that you don't believe in that you might spread the disbelief to people who would otherwise, you know, be allowed to enjoy the pleasures of faith. Um, this is one of those situations. I don't think any of these is right. I think what's right is actually acoustic. We don't know where the top point of the tongue is. It's just a handy way to talk about it so we can sort things, so we can pretend to give a good articulatory description of vowels. I'd say use the one that's in the book because... If you have to pick an arbitrary one, you might as well pick the one you paid money for. Now, um, and this is just to let you know, don't trust what you find online. It's also someone who said, seems to me this is a good way to do it. Where you can get interesting, though, is where we're going uh, Thursday, which is the discussion of how acoustics can point out something different about the vowel chart. They can actually organize things for you. And I will show you a website produced by our very own Professor Tyler Candle uh, that allows you to feed data into, uh, into an algorithm that then produces a chart that looks a lot like one of these, except with no lines in it. And it's purely based on acoustics, not based on any claim about where your tongue is. So we can talk about this being a useful way to organize vowels. Essentially, the acoustics line up with what we think is going on with the tongue, or with what we used to think was going on with the tongue, and we now are no longer sure. And so all we need to do is come up with 
areas of the chart. And that's kind of what this one is admitting. We just need to get in the neighborhood. The rest will work itself out. And in fact, every articulation of any given vowel is not represented by a single point. It's represented by a cloud of points. And you just are picking one arbitrarily to represent that cloud. So if they just made it sound like vowels are impossible, you're welcome. Um, for those of you who've been complaining about vowels, you're right. Uh, I still want you to be able to know three high front vowels. Are they rounded or unrounded? And you should be able to spot them. You should be able to describe them. That high back vowel that's unrounded. Oh, look! Instead of the upside down M and instead of the, the V with a tail under it, you've got the umlaut used for its other function. Here it fronts the O, here it backs the E. They also A. O, O, A, yeah. A, 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 A. Ah, ah. No, I won't ask you to transcribe this. So, at this point, I want to leave the discussion of where your tongue is. And if there are questions you would like to have answered, this would be a good time to ask them. Okay, I will assume the lack of questions is indicative or something. So, now we'll go to a third articulator. We brought this up already with English vowels. Um, vowels can be nasalized. As you're just saying the vowel, you just drop the soft palate. Now air goes through your nose. And we have it in all languages that have nasal stops. So, if you're going to say a word with a nasal stop, like say, manly, manly is a fine word to practice on, uh, or womanly, that one a bit less because the nasal stop is uh, in the unstressed syllable. But as you're saying, ma n li, going from a with your soft palate completely <coughs> closed to mm, where your mouth is closed, but your soft palate is open. There's a pivot point here. So let's see. Mouth, open, closed. Soft palate, otherwise known as velum, closed, open. Those two changes, in order for these to be correct narrow transcriptions, those two changes would have to happen at the exact same millisecond. That is, you would have to have really good coordination. It's almost like, you know, right? you got your hands here, bring your fingers together, and at the exact same second have both of them touch. You can kind of do that because you're used to using your hands in parallel. Now imagine you're trying to go from ah just to close your mouth on the end. Ah, ah. And you're keeping the soft palate closed the whole time, no problem. Now you go from ah, ah. So you're trying to close your tongue on your alveolar ridge at exactly the second that you drop the soft palate. So man. <laughs> it's really hard. In fact, what we know from studying acoustics and from studying videos of this is it's not possible, really. What happens almost always is the soft palate is closed until about here, and then it opens, and the mouth is open until about here, and then it closes, and that means for a little period here, you have incidental nasalization. Now, I'm putting it in a way that's not IPA, right? Just to make it clear. This is an oral vowel with a little bit of nasal added. You know, it's like a superscript nasal or something. Um, 
And I tried to write it this way here because, in fact, it happens a little bit at the beginning of manly as well. So you have man, m is mouth closed, soft palate open, a, mouth open, soft palate closed, m, mouth closed, soft palate open. So you actually have that dance go in both directions. What we find in the languages of the world is that if you start with a nasal stop, we're pretty good at releasing both at once. So you, we can open the mouth and close the soft palate pretty well at the same time. It's the other way that we don't do so well. We tend to have, we tend to anticipate the nasal coming up and we drop the soft palate early. So here, you might get a little bit of incidental nasalization at the start of this vowel, but you get quite a bit at the end of the vowel. So this is how it starts. And I put up the word Lima, I'll do it again. I know you're going to get bored with my Brazil stories, but I still, I just, it bears repeating because it was so real how striking it was that I, as a Spanish speaker, arrived in Brazil and I was talking about taking a trip to the capital of Peru and I said, yeah, uh, 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 sim, eu vou para Lima. God, it's hard, I've already got the accent now. Yeah. Lima. I, I tried to say it like Spanish, which is basically li. A little bit of incidental nasalization right here, and then ma. And I was corrected immediately. No, lima, lima. It's like, yeah, but that's the whole vowel. Uh huh. Lima. It's not lima. It's lima. lima. So you just get used to saying the entire vowel nasalized. Now, what's going on here? In cognitive terms, what's happened is Brazilian Portuguese at least the Portuguese as spoken in Brazil, picked up on that incidental nasalization, and they made it go the whole length of the vowel. They expanded it. They made it a salient feature of the vowel. Now, what is that? What's the word for when you do that? This is a word that might show up on your exam. It's what happens with uh, when B and P are pronounced both unvoiced at the starts of words. Is it assimilation? Um, that is assimilation. This is assimilation that puts the nasal there. But it's also displaced contrast. This is where the contrast of that nasal gets pushed over onto the vowel. And what's worse, once that happens, you don't need to pronounce that consonant anymore. And so let's see, let's give a good uh, combing. means they eat. So this in Spanish would be comen, right? But here it's comen. And there is no M there. There is simply a nasalized vowel. So this is... And what that means is that Brazilian uh, linguists, especially when they get started, if they hear nasalization on a vowel, they actually write a consonant. They are sure they're hearing the consonant because they have been trained by their orthography to know there's a consonant there. Otherwise, you wouldn't have a nasalized vowel because they don't write nasalized vowels in general. Only, uh, well, there's one. Uh, so, um, uh, um, tão. So they do have tão, which comes originally from Latin tan. You know, so meaning so, so much. Tan grande, so, so big. Tan grande. Yeah. And if it sounds like it's all going through your nose, that's because it is. Every time there's a nasal consonant, it ends up... So some of these have become in the writing system. Some of them have not. These should both be nasalized in the writing system because those are nasal vowels, but they're not. So what happens? If someone comes along, let's say all literate people... Uh, uh, forget how to write in Brazilian Portuguese. And a linguist comes along to develop a new writing system for them. There are phonemic differences between nasalized and non-nasalized vowels. And those will show up in a writing system so that, you know, there's no M there. That wouldn't be a part of the writing system. But this would be, that that's a nasalized vowel would be part of the writing system. And so you end up shifting the contrast from a nasal stop to a nasalized vowel. 
And then that goes on as part of the vowel system. And so now any vowel in Brazilian Portuguese can have two forms, an oral form and a nasal form. And you just doubled your vowel inventory by simply losing some nasal stops, displacing the contrast of nasality onto the vowels. You now have twice as many vowels and a few fewer stops. Except probably those stops still exist at the starts of syllables like main. So you don't even lose stops. You just lose the ones that are after the vowels because they're the ones that create nasalized vowels. And so you end up with languages like oh, all of the Indic languages, Nepali, Hindi, those all have nasalized vowels written into the writing system and they could come anywhere. Um, they, the nasalization happened so long ago that it's no longer, it, the source is no longer captured in the writing system. So they're just nasalized vowels. It was also true when I studied Tibetan in field methods back in 1987, 88. Uh, even though I spoke Nepali already at the time, so I spoke a language with nasalized vowels, I couldn't hear them at first. And it took, you know, a month or so of getting used to it until, okay, that's nasalized. Then you just know. So it takes experience. But the point here is that it is a phonetic feature that we can capture with the transcription. And you just have to get used to saying it through your nose. So you go, ah, ah, e, e, u, u, etc. One thing you'll notice if you have the fluoroscopy, which I do, unfortunately, I went to two minutes and 30 seconds in three different fluoroscopy videos I have, and I didn't find the nasalized vowels in any of those three. Damn it. Uh, what I wanted to show you was if you actually hold your tongue still and drop your soft palate, it changes the quality of the vowel so that it no longer sounds like an E with a nasal overlay. It sounds like a slightly lowered vowel, more like an I with a nasal overlay. And if you want to say E, E, so that it's clearly E, you actually have to move your tongue farther up and forward. So as you drop your soft palate, you adjust your tongue to maintain more or less the same acoustic target as the oral vowel. So it's not really the same tongue position precisely, but it's close enough. So we just continue to act like it's, it's the high front nasalized vowel, even though it's slightly lower and slightly backer uh, as a nasalized vowel. Okay? Questions on nasalization? All you have to remember is to put the tilde over the top of the vowel. And if you see the tilde over the top of the vowel, you have to remember which, what that means. Okay? Questions on nasal? Woof! Laryngeal settings, we talked about this briefly already. Unmarked vowels have modal voicing, including nasalized vowels. So, e, whatever, you can sing them. If you go to breathy voice, this is generally only one syllable in a word. It's not going to be like you say, oh, now I'm going to talk like this, and it's a whole different set of words. Uh, it's like you just have one vowel, usually a low pitch, so a low tone will also be breathy. You can also have creaky vowels. Sometimes that's an entire word. Sometimes it's just a single syllable. Okay. So that's our vocal fry used phonologically. We have long vowels, and the unmarked vowels are the short vowels. Long vowels, generally, when you see the difference in languages I've worked on that have a vowel length distinction, the short vowels are 50 to 150 milliseconds. The long vowels are 150, 200, 250 milliseconds. They're easily twice as long. I mean, you can really hear it. Um, and they tend to come in a rhythm, long, short, long, short. You know, kana wadu, kana wadu. You know, you can tell which vowel there is the lengthened one. Kanawadu. Yeah, well, there's three ahs in there. Which, which ah? Give the whole syllable. Kanawadu. Na. Na, yeah. So you can hear it. And it doesn't take long to catch that distinction when a language has it. And then there's tone. Tone is complicated. And once again, the IPA fails uh, to uh, provide... Uh, a single one symbol, one pronunciation uh, map. That's partly because tone is actually not clearly in the acoustic signal. It's relative, and that means you can see variations going up and down, but you can't actually see by looking at a tone, oh, which one is that? 
Well, it depends on what word you said right before it and what word you said right after it. And then you can tell it's either high, mid, low, whatever it is. But because people have talked about languages with as many as five different levels of what they call register tone, um, there are ways to mark. So a three-tone system would look like this. If you need more, you can put this afterwards. And so this, you see the low tone, low mid-tone, mid-tone, high mid-tone, high tone. So you can just see where it is iconically on the vertical bar. That, yeah. Or some people just put numbers because it's easier to set low as one, high as five, put your number. Now, the numbers have a benefit when you move away from register tones because you're dealing with what they call contour tones. Contours is like sequences of tones on a single vowel. And so instead of it just being ah or ah, you have ah and ah. So R for rising, ah, F for falling, ah. And notice those are symbols that are available in the IPA. So if you want to put it here, well, you can do this. And this allows you to get a five-way distinction. So here are three different rising tones, from low to mid, from low to high, and from mid to high. So you could capture three different rising tones with this system, and so on. Falling tones, this just says it falls. It doesn't say from where to where. This says it falls from high to mid, from high to low, from mid to low. And then rising, falling, I've seen it. I don't actually have the font to do it but it looks like this, <laughs> all over a single vowel. And in that case, it's from mid to high to low, from low to high to low, from low to high to mid. That is, you could imagine all of the combinations being possible. There are a limited number of combinations in any individual language, but these things do exist, where the tones can be ah, or ah, or ah, and then if you think it sounds like I'm singing, it's because I am, because I don't speak a language that does that. And so I'm just singing to try to guess. Numbers are a handy way to do that. One to three, low to mid. One to five, low to high. Three to five, mid to high, and so on. For the falling tones and for the rising falling. So you can capture them in these different ways. What's the IPA do? Whatever's convenient for the linguist who is doing the phonetic description. If you only have one rising tone, that's good enough and it's easier to do than one of these. Why have this extra detail if you don't need it? If you only have one falling tone, again, this is easier to do than to do this or this. As your tones get more complex, numbers are a great way to capture them, kind of, kind of iconically. So this kind of stuff is out there. Now notice what I just said, the IPA exists because it's a tool. It has a function. You don't choose the most complex way of transcribing something unless you have to. Narrow transcriptions are what you use your first month working with the language until you figure out which sounds matter to the speakers. Then you do your phonology and then you just write phonology. So when I say People do this. Maybe your first day you're doing this because you're trying to figure out. But always what you do is you catch a word like uh, in Tibetan as we were working on it, we had the word da, which meant tiger, and ya, which meant yak. And then we had da, which meant arrow. Uh, no, dom, which was bear, and ta, which was arrow, and ta, which was horse. So we had ta, da, ta. We didn't have da, but we had dom. So we took, why do I remember those four words? Because every time I learned a new word, I had to know what the tone was. So I'd say, say horse and say the new word. I'd hear da plus whatever it was. It's like, okay, it's not that. Uh, okay, uh, say arrow and then say the new word. <laughs> and by the time they got through with all four words, I would know what the tone was on the new word. All right, so essentially, your job when you're doing work on a language that you don't know that doesn't have a clean writing system that captures this stuff, your job is to figure out what matters. Where do you find minimal pairs? Where do you find contrast? And then, I'm not gonna 
do a narrow transcription of English once I know how to, once I know what the distinctions are. I do a narrow transcription of English so you can learn to do a narrow transcription. Uh, that is, it's a pedagogical technique. It's not something you would do for any practical purpose except to study English phonetics and phonology. We're going to phonology. So you'll need it, and you already do. But when you get into this stuff, I mean, just look at that. If you tried to do that for every language you started working on, we could do it for English as well. Because, you know, all you have to do is just imagine somebody saying, could you say car again? Car? Yeah, no, the way you said it before, oh, car. Car. <laughs> okay. 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 And imagine doing a narrow transcription of all of those and turning out this fantastic tone system, which it turns out is completely irrelevant for the phonology of the language. In other words, you only want to write down what you need. So this stuff is there. Unless you happen to be working on a tone language, I'm going to suggest that you now, well, not now, after next Tuesday, you just forget about it until you see a phonology problem that has tone. If you go on to 450 phonology, you will see phonology problems with tone. And there are cool models for dealing with all this messy contour stuff. I highly recommend them. Um, that is, I had fun with them, and I think it's possible that some here might have fun with them too. Uh, but for now, you know all you need to know about tone if you understood the stuff I was just telling you. Questions you would like to ask? No? Okay. Boom. Advanced tongue root. These are in African languages. Phonetically, basically you have E, and then that has an advanced tongue root, E, and then you have an E, A, E, E, fuck, I can't even come close to doing it. Um, for this, I recommend that we go to the website because Everyone I know who's worked on African languages with an advanced tongue root distinction says they do it just like we have to do tone in a language that you don't speak. Because you can't tell what vowel you're hearing. You just don't hear it. And so you get one word that you know has this vowel, or one word you know has this vowel, and you say, say this word that I know, and now say this word that I don't know. Is that the same vowel? No. Okay. Say this word that I know, and now say this other word. Is that the same vowel? And then they'll go, yeah. So, okay. And then you know how to write it. In other words, you don't pick it up with your ear very quickly. And what's nasty is that often in the writing systems, they don't want to do this diacritic shit. Can you imagine? And so they end up writing it as if it were the lax vowels of English. So advanced tongue root are the tense vowels, and non-advanced tongue root is the lax vowels. If you look at their writing systems, what you need to know is it has... Nothing to do with the English tense lax vowels. Nothing. They are unrelated. People are just choosing those because you can type them on a keyboard. So they're being practical. So what is happening? Your tongue root comes forward with advanced tongue root. That means your pharyngeal space gets bigger, and that changes the vertical too, acoustically. And then you can hear that acoustic difference, especially if you've been listening for it since you were a small child. Now what's interesting they use Akan as their example here. Um, in our department, Doris Payne and two of our graduate students about eight years ago did an acoustic analysis because they had a speaker of Akan and Doris was working on a language called Maasai, Ma, which also has an advanced tongue root distinction. And the speaker of Akan was a linguistic student here and he could not hear the advanced tongue root vowels distinction in Maasai. And so they were kind of going, well, how do you not hear it? You speak a language that does it. And at that point, the light bulb goes off. <gasps> it's not an it. That is, advanced tongue root isn't always the same thing. You can get pairs of vowels that are different, and people saying, oh, is that an African language? That must be advanced tongue root. Mark that one as advanced tongue root and that one as non-advanced tongue root. And they just do that. But it turns out it's not the same movement being done. And so phonetically, that's not actually what's going on. You can read that article about Maasai and Nakan, advanced tongue root. They've shown that it's different acoustically. And they speculate, because they didn't have like cameras going, there are limits to what you can do in experiments. 
when you're exposing people to radiation and whatnot. If only we'd have had that camera that goes down the back of the back of the net in the pharynx, I'm sure we would have seen pharyngeal widening for one and something else for the other. But we didn't have that camera. For the Advanced is pointing forward, retracted is pointing backward. Okay. So these are in a pair, and this pointing forward is like the tents, pointing backward is like the lattice. When they write it. So for this, I just want to remind you, come on, baby, come on, that you have this cool website that's associated with your textbook, and I want you to look at this for a second. For a con, they did do x-rays, and they did the tracing. So here's the advanced tongue root E, and here's the non-advanced tongue root E. So the advanced tongue root E goes higher, it's farther forward, so the tongue is a big muscle, it's bunched up more, so it has to go higher because it has to go somewhere. I mean, you can't just shrink your tongue. So when it's forward, it's higher, <laughs> and so you see that it's forward, it arcs up higher and pretty far to the front. Wait. There it is. And when it's back, it's still higher all the way to here, and then it crosses and comes down a little lower there. So you can see the tongue shapes are really different. And the reason I want you to see this website, and I may not be able to do this because it's your ass on Here we go. Ah. Come on, baby. C. 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 Now, doesn't that sound like A as opposed to E, right? Now, catch this. C. C. And now, listen to this. Wabetu. C. Almost time. <sighs> Now imagine you're the one with the job of saying, all right, say the word say so I can listen to the vowel. Now say the word pull it out. Is that vowel in the middle of the same vowel? Listen to it again. Wabetu, say, are they the same vowel? Say. Wabetu. I would have said yes, they say no. If you can hear the difference, I applaud you and I recommend that you go into field phonetics. Um, anyway, there's a bunch there. You can click on them. You can check it out. You can see the tongue tracings. Compare those to the ones of English earlier, and I think it's chapter three. Uh, so just get a sense of what that's about. Advanced tongue root is cool, if only because someone in our department has studied it. And um, I would like a two-minute paper from each of you. So feel free to do it electronically or to do it on a piece of paper. And we will look forward to providing further torture on Thursday. That would just stay there until next Thursday. Because we're going to be talking about those two tubes again.